Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, uh, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. doing this Sunday morning? Man, I'm going to tell you what, Christmas Eve, so Eve at ACC this year is going to be uh, a really awesome, unique experience. You don't want to miss it. I do want you, to, want you to know the whole idea of getting a ticket reserved is mostly just for you. Uh, those of you who kind of attend ACC on a regular basis, the ticket is not absolutely necessary. In fact, uh, we expect, go out and invite as many people as you can, can to come to Eve at ACC they don't need to have any pre-reserved tickets or anything like that. They're going to be welcome at any service they come to. Same goes for you. The reason we're asking you to go ahead and snag a ticket, though, is so that we know where you're coming and what services you're going to be at so we can go ahead and plan and make sure we don't have too many people at one service. So we're really excited about uh, really uh, kind of a cool element of something we're doing this year. Uh, before we talk, though, about Eve at ACC, that's the 24th. Right now, we're in the middle of our Generous series. We're talking about what it means to be a generous church. And the reason we're, we're exploring this idea of generosity is because we know that our God is a generous God, and our God asks us to be and to imitate Him, to be like Him and to imitate Him, right? We see in Ephesians 5, it says, imitate God, therefore, right, in everything you do. And we recognize that as a church, we want to go into the world and we want to be like our God. We want to imitate him. And if his generosity goes on in this verse, it says, because you are his dear children, live a life filled with love following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Listen, if the example we're trying to follow is an example of such incredible generosity that Jesus laid his life down on the cross for you, then anything we can muster up, anything we can do as far as generosity is concerned, really is going to fail in comparison. It's not going to really kind of be equal, but we're going to do everything we can to learn what it means to be a generous church because our God is a generous God and we want to be like him. So as we've been exploring this over uh, last week and over the next few weeks, we're talking through this idea of the path towards being generous. And last week we talked about the importance of having an open mind, renewing the way you think. If you can change the way you think, you won't conform to the patterns of this world. Listen, the world wants you to see things in a way where everything around you is, is limited, you only have so much, and you're going to run out. Because if you see things that way, you're not going to be a generous person. But if we can change the way we think, it'll lead us to what we're going to talk about today, which is to open our eyes. If we can open our eyes, we're going to be able to see things that we weren't able to see before because of our renewed mind. And our open eyes are going to lead us to having an open heart and then into having open hands over the next couple of weeks. Have you ever seen one of those pictures before? I haven't seen them in a long time, so they're kind of not really in vogue anymore, I guess. But you know those pictures that people would hang up 
and they just looked like a bunch of dots and pixels. It didn't make any sense, right, until you kind of step back and you have to not look at the picture. You have to look beyond the picture. You have to kind of focus your eyes somehow in the distance, and all of a sudden, a 3D shape appears in the picture. You know what I'm talking about? Do you remember these? This is kind of the idea of what we were going to talk about today, because we all have the ability to see with our physical eyes the here and now. We're able to see what's around us. Uh, those of you who are able to, to see with your physical eyes, you, you, right, what's right around you is, is fairly uh, visible. But we want to talk more than just about physical eyes. We want to talk about uh, spiritual eyes. And we're going to explore what that means. Let me show you why having open eyes is so important. In Matthew 6, it says this, Your eye is a lamp that provides light for the body. In other words, your eyes are this tool that God gives you so that light can enter in to your life. It's, it's kind of the thing that we have that absorbs the world around us, the, the goodness and the blessings that God has given to us. Our eyes are the tool we have, the lamp that provides light for the body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. In other words, we all have eyes. Uh, you know, and, and the, this idea, though, of, of physical eyes versus spiritual eyes, uh, there's something really, really important to d- differentiate here. Because if you always see things a certain way and somebody else always sees things a different way, it's, it's, it's understanding the way we look at our world and the way we understand it. And, and can you actually see things that aren't there, that maybe your eyes weren't meant to see physically? And that's this I- idea. I want to pray a verse that talks about our eyes. I want to ask you to pray uh, kind of this, this concept with me. In Psalm 119, verse 18, it says this. It says, open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. So my prayer this morning as we start is, I, I, you know, we, we have this incredible gift of God's Word, and I believe that every a word in God's word and its original transcript, original transcript is true and inerrant, and we can count on the words of God. And we, we want God to open our eyes to his truth this morning. If you come in here this morning and then walk away the exact same person that you came in as, I, I think that you're, you missed out on something. So let's pray and ask God to open our eyes so that we can see what he wants us to learn about him this morning. Father, we, we pray right now for open eyes. I, I, I see the irony in the fact that as I'm praying to you for open eyes, I'm standing here on stage praying with closed eyes. God, you, you know that when I, when I ask for open eyes, I'm not talking about necessarily in this moment of physical eyes. God, I want you to open my heart. I want you to open my, my hands. I want you to open my mind. My, my eyes are this, this tool that you've given to me that, that light enters into my body. God, I pray that you would open my eyes to see things the way you want me to see them. God, I pray that for this entire congregation, God, that you would help us to see who you are and the incredible truths of your word as we explore them together this morning. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we're talking through what it means to be generous, have you ever noticed, let me tell you a little confession about me. I, there's two types of doctors I really don't enjoy going to. I don't know if anyone really enjoys going to the doctor. Uh, hopefully there's not any doctors in here I just offended, but I, I really don't like going to the dentist. In fact, I don't. Something's got to be pretty, pretty bad and painful for me to go see a dentist. I just don't enjoy it. Maybe it's a fear or phobia of mine. Now you know. Uh, my, whole, my wife takes my kids, you know, twice a year, and I'm just like, I'm good. Um, another type of doctor I don't really enjoy is an, an ophthalmologist. I don't know any other doctor that you go in to see a doctor that's supposed to make things better, and you leave being able to see worse. You know what I'm talking about? How can you go into an eye doctor, and then every time you leave, you're like, you need special glasses, and you can't see anything, and you're thinking, why did I go to him for, right? It just doesn't make sense, but I... I In college, I I grew up, I always had perfect vision, I always could see really well. My dad had 20-20 vision until the day he died, and I thought I had inherited that gene, so I was really excited. And then in college, I started noticing I wasn't able to see things 
uh, too well, far off, and a friend of mine loaned me his glasses, and as soon as I put them on, I could see again. I thought, man, this is, maybe I need glasses. So I went to an eye doctor, and they did all their tests, and they, you know, puffing things at your face and all sorts, you know, all the things they do. And then the doctor comes back in, and he says, I figured out what's wrong. And I said, okay, lay it on me. He says, uh, you're, 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 far, you're, you're farsighted, nearsighted. And I said, wait, nearsighted? No, 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 hold on, doc. That doesn't make any sense. I can see things that are near perfectly well. Uh, it's the things that are far away that I'm struggling with. He's like, yeah, 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 that's nearsighted. Hey, seriously, is there any other medical profession that tells you what's wrong with you by telling you what you're good at? Do you go into the doctor with a broken arm and they're like, all right, what is it? And he's like, well, you're good legged. I mean, that's just right. That's not the way we do it, right? What's wrong with you? Your, your arm is broken. Uh, you can't see things that are far away. But anyway, you, we go in, right? And, and as I understand now that my vision is such that I have a hard time seeing things far away, I can see things that are close really easily. That probably the same thing is true for us spiritually. If you think about it, we're really good at seeing kind of things right in front of us. If you put something in front of your physical eyes, if you are a, a seeing person, if your eyes are working well, you're able to see things with your physical eyes. But oftentimes we have a hard time seeing things that are kind of far off, especially spiritual things, things that our, our, our physical eyes can't see. And there's this concept of two different types of eyes in the Bible. There's our physical eyes and there's our spiritual eyes. Let me show you a verse that helps us see both. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 and 18, it says this. Uh, Paul says, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Our present troubles, these are the things like that are our physical eyes right around us, the things that we can see, right? They won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now, that's our physical eyes, rather we fix our gaze. <laughs> Hold on. Like this is a word that says like you're focusing your eyes, you're fixing your gaze, you're looking at what? Things that cannot be seen. That's spiritual eyes. Uh, if, if our physical eyes can see what can be seen physically, our spiritual eyes allow us to see things that can't be seen physically. And when I'm saying that we need to open our eyes as step two of being a generous church, we need to open both. We need to open our spiritual eyes and we need to open our physical eyes to the needs around us. And let me explain this a little bit. And one of the best ways I know to explain this concept of opening your spiritual eyes is, is through scripture. There's a passage I want to read to you. Before we do that, one of the things I've noticed about what causes people to, to be kind of stingy, that causes people to not be generous, is what I call the lie of limited resources. And this is a lie that Satan tells us that says there's only so much to go around. There's only, there's a limited amount of whatever it is. Let me give you an example. Any of you guys from a large family, you grew up and you had a lot of siblings. Have you ever noticed that people from a large family, they tend to be quick eaters? I'll tell you why. It's because of the lie of limited resources. When that basket of crescent rolls hits the table, you know you got to eat quick. If you, there's any chance of you having two of them, you got to be one of the first ones done, right? You got to eat quickly when there's, a, because you're looking in the basket and there's this concept of there's only so many crescent rolls. So I need to, uh, it's this, right, th this idea that we understand with our physical eyes, there's only so much, and, and eventually they're all going to be gone. And that's what this lie of limited resources is. This lie is this understanding that if, if Satan can help us to see things spiritually the way we see with our physical eyes a basket of crescent rolls, then I can trick them all into being stingy people. No one will be generous if they see everything with these eyes and, and instead of their spiritual eyes. And it's amazing to me how some of the most generous people I know, and I bet the same is true for you. Think about the most generous person you know. 
I bet they don't have a ton of resources. Oftentimes, the people that have the, the littlest to give end up being the most generous people you know. And the opposite is true. I remember a few years back, uh, not in this last election cycle, but before that, there was a vice presidential candidate who released his taxes. And I remember looking at the tax document and kind of seeing what it would tell me about the person and the way they do life. And it showed me that they made $320,000 a year. That sounds really nice. I don't make $320,000 a year. Uh, but $320,000 a year, I'm thinking, man, what an incredible opportunity for generosity. I know, I'm telling you right now, if I made $320,000 a year, I would be a ton more generous. And then I would go over to the, uh, the kind of the itemized deductions, the charitable contributions total, average over the last 10 years was $320. I thought, man, how is that even possible? How, how, do, how do you have that much income coming in and, and find so little to, to be generous with? I struggle with that. So I want to I wanna show you one of the coolest stories in scripture. It's in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 6. And one of the things I'm going to do is I'm not going to put the scripture up on the screen. So if you want to follow along with me, grab a Bible. I put the page number up on the screen. It's in page 223 if you're using one of our chair Bibles so you can find it real easily. I want to show you one of the most interesting passages, a, a really cool story in scripture that shows what it means to have spiritual eyes instead of just physical eyes. And let me set this story up. This story is it, it really cool. So there's this, this king named King Aram. And King Aram is the bad guy in the story, okay? And he is fighting against Israel. He wants to wage war against Israel, and we know that Israel, these are God's people. Now at this time, Israel has a king that's not that great either. So we have two lousy kings fighting against each other. And king, uh, the king of Aram is fighting against the people of Israel. And his strategy, according to 2 Kings chapter 6, is he's taking his army and he's putting them and kind of hiding them in different places to prepare an ambush against the people of Israel. He's putting them in places and hoping that the people of Israel don't know what's coming and where they're coming from. But every time the king moves his army to a certain place, Within moments, the Israeli people, the, the people of Israel, uh, are now know what's coming and they are, are, are ready for it. To the point where the king of Aram thinks, and he says it in this, who is the spy? Who keeps telling Israel where we're coming from? How do they keep knowing what's about to happen? And then what happens, uh, again, you can read all this in, in 2 Kings 6. We're going to read some here in a second. What happens then is they say, there is no spy amongst your people, king. The, the reason that they keep knowing where we're coming from is they have this guy, this prophet named Elisha, and Elisha is the one who can tell them even the conversations you have privately in your bedroom. In other words, as soon as you make a decision, Elisha, God tells him about it, and he goes and tells the king of Israel, and that's why all of your plans keep getting foiled. And he's so upset about it, we pick up this story in verse 13. He says, go and find out where he is. Go find out where Elisha is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. His idea is if I go get Elisha and I take him out of the picture, now there's no one to tell the king of Israel where we're going to be attacking from. All right? So th this, is what, this is his plan. It sounds like a, a lame plan considering Elisha always knows what's going on and God tells him everything. But this is the guy's plan. Go find out where he is. We'll send troops to seize him. And then uh, a report came back. Elisha is at Dothan. So one night the king of Iran, this is uh, in verse 14. So one night the king of Iran sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. I want you to picture this in your head. The word great army, kings, uh, or the king sends a great army with chariots and horses surrounding the city. In other words, there's a city called Dothan. It's where Elisha is. And all around the city, Elisha is surrounded. And I want you to know, Elisha doesn't have any army with him. He's not a military guy. He's not a soldier. He's just a prophet in a city. There is no soldiers. There is no chariots. There are no horses to be seen around Elisha with physical eyes. 
And then verse 15, it says, When the servant of Elisha got up the next morning and went outside, there were troops and horses and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. I love the way this, uh, this is worded. It says that he went outside and he saw that they were surrounded. In other words, he saw that they were about to die. They were about to get captured. Something really bad was about to happen. And then it says that the servant said, uh, oh, sir, what are we to do now? I think he said something, oh, something else. Oh, whatever you want to put in there, right? He's thinking, what in the world is about to happen? We are surrounded and something really, really bad is about to go down. We are about to die. What do you want to do? And he's freaking out. I think all of us would be because there is an army surrounding Elisha and his servant. And then it goes on, right? This is verse 16. It says, don't be afraid, Elisha told him. <laughs> like, what? We are surrounded. We don't have anybody with us. And you're telling us not to be afraid. And then Elisha goes on, for there are more on our side than there are on theirs. Now, this isn't making any sense to the servant. Because I want you to hear this. The servant right now is going out of the tent. He's going out and looking out on the hillside, and he's using his physical eyes. These are the same eyes that you and I use when we log into our bank account. These are the same eyes that you and I use when we open up our calendar and we see whether or not we have any time to serve somebody. These are the same eyes that we use when we're trying to figure out whether or not we can use our talent to help someone else, or whether or not there's anything left to give, whether or not we have a possession that somebody else maybe needs more than we do. These are the same eyes that we use. We go out and we use our physical eyes when we ought to use our spiritual eyes. So let's keep reading. Verse 17, this is the most important verse here. Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, can you read these next three words with me? Open his eyes. Listen, his eyes were already open. He already had his physical eyes open. He saw that they were surrounded. So Elisha is praying not about his physical eyes. Elisha is praying about his spiritual eyes. And then it says, and let him see. And then the Lord opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. In other words, he knew in that moment, we have more people on our side of this battle than they have on theirs. Exactly what Elisha said. I have no reason to be afraid because when I open up my spiritual eyes, I see that what, I, what, what my physical eyes, the story that my physical eyes were telling me wasn't the full story. That, they, that we were surrounded by chariots of fire and horsemen and soldiers from God that are gonna fight the battle for us. And my, one of the coolest things about this story is you're about to, if you keep reading, you'll notice that they weren't even necessary. God had the army there to fight this battle, but th there was no battle to be fought because as the, the enemy is now coming, right, they're using their physical eyes. They think that they're, they got this in, in the bag. Elisha prays again, and he says, uh, God, blind them, confuse them, close their eyes. Don't let them see what's actually going on here. I don't know if any of you are fans of Star Wars, but this is straight out of Star Wars right here. So what happens is the bad guys come into, they come right up to Elisha, the guy they're looking for. Elisha is the one they're looking for, okay? And they come up and they're like, hey, where's Elisha? And Elisha says, I am not the one you're looking for. <laughs> and they move on. And they end up in the wrong place. But here's, here's the cool thing about this story. If Satan can lie to us and tell us that there is limited resources. There is only so much to go around. You need to hang on to it. As soon as you're done paying for what you want and what you need, there's not going to be anything left for anyone else. If we can use only our physical eyes to look at our own circumstances, we will often not be generous people because we will see things the way the evil one wants us to see things, and every time we will miss the fact that if we open our spiritual eyes, we see the truth that God is a God of unlimited resources. We also see an example of this in the, the New Testament. 
in, in Mark chapter 8. Uh, to set this up, in Mark chapter 8, remember, oftentimes when you open the Bible, if you're like me, you open it up and you think, these are Bible guys. These are, these are stories of guys, uh, you know, the Bible guys. But I want you to change your way you word this. These are not stories of Bible guys. These are stories of guys and girls in the Bible. These are stories of people just like you and just like me who are just as idiotic as you and me. They make mistakes all the time. And this is an example of regular dudes. The, the 12 disciples of Jesus, have, they just watched Jesus perform some really cool miracles. They just watched Jesus multiply bread into baskets of overflow. They've watched all this, and now here they are in a boat in Mark chapter 8. It says, at this, they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. And just picture this, right? You've got the 12 disciples in a boat, and they're arguing with each other. I can picture it right now. Hey, I, you, I, th- I thought you were bringing the bread. No, you said, James said he was bringing it. No, Peter, you're, so they're, they're sitting there worried that there's no bread. And Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, why are you arguing about having no bread? And then we get to the, the punchline. You have eyes, can't you see? Let me ask you this, church. You have eyes, follower of Christ. Can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? When I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread, how many baskets of leftover did you pick up afterward? Jesus already knows the answer to this question. Twelve, they said. And when I fed 4,000 with seven loaves, how many large baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Seven, they said. And Jesus really kind of digs it in, and he says, don't you understand yet? What he's essentially saying is, why can't you open your spiritual eyes? Right now, you're looking at your hands with your physical eyes, and you're seeing that nobody brought any bread. You're like, oh, how are we going to share with anyone else, let alone ourselves? There's nothing for us to eat. And Jesus says, have you not, church, listen, have you not seen what I've been able to do at ACC over the past 20 years? Have you not seen what I'm capable of as I've been blessing Glen Burnie through this church? Have you not been paying attention to how I work and what I'm capable of and that I am a God of unlimited resources? Why the closed-mindedness in thinking I, I, there's not enough? There's nothing left. If I, if I give, there, there's nothing for me. The reality is this, God will never call us to something and not provide you the resources needed to accomplish it. I say that again. God will never call you to something and not provide you with the resources necessary to accomplish it. Here's another thing, another set of eyes we need to open up, and these are our, our physical eyes. Now, you might, um, you might think, yeah, I open those up every morning. <laughs> I open my physical eyes. What I mean by this is we need to start recognizing that when our mind is renewed and we can now see things with spiritual eyes, when we're asking God every day to open our eyes to see things the way he sees them, to see that there is unlimited resources behind our God, when we're able to do that, we're now able to open our physical eyes and see actual needs around us. We're able to see things that are happening and areas and places where God might be calling us into. Let me show you a great example of that in scripture. In Acts chapter 8, there's a story about Philip. And here's, here's what happens in Acts 26. It says, as for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So here's essentially what happens. An angel of the Lord, so a spokesman of God says to Philip, I want you to go south, okay? I want you to go down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, here's my problem, and maybe you're the same way. If God were to tell me to do something like that, if God were to say right now to me, Matt, I want you to go south, right, from, from Glen Burnie to Annapolis, in my mind, what I picture is I now have a destination. I have some place that God wants me to be, and if I'm going to be a good person, I need to get on the road because God wants me where? In Annapolis. That's where God wants me. 
And I try to do everything I can to limit distraction because I, I'm a man on a mission, that God has given me this mission of, of getting to Annapolis, and I'm, nothing's going to stop me, so I'm going to go south, and I'm, I'm going to get to Annapolis. And unfortunately, my eyes sometimes are therefore blinded by what's actually happening around me. Do you know, I, this is really important, God's calling in your life is usually more of a direction than it is a destination. I want, I want to make sure you don't miss out what I'm saying here. When God calls you to go south from Glen Burnie to Annapolis, it doesn't mean he wants you in Annapolis. It means he wants you on the road between Glen Burnie and Annapolis. And maybe somewhere on that road, he's going to ask you to stop and turn and go a different direction. So that's what's happening here. Philip is, on, is asked to go on this road to, towards Gaza south. And then we end up in Acts 8, 27 to 29. It says, so he started out and he met a, the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Candake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And the Holy Spirit said to him, Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. I love this. So Philip is not me, thank goodness. Philip is not so focused, so laser focused on getting to Gaza that he's closed off all distraction. In fact, he's open to distraction. He hears the Holy Spirit tell him, I want you to pause your journey. Maybe you're like intent about getting to Gaza, but that, that's not really what I want for you here in this moment. I don't want you in Gaza. I want you to stop and I want you to go over here for a moment. And I want you to walk alongside, uh, next up, uh, up next to this carriage that's parked here. If you have a renewed mind, you're going to be able to hear the Holy Spirit prompt you to open up your physical eyes and see things that God wants you to see. Have you ever seen something with your physical eyes and felt in that moment the Holy Spirit nudging you to do something and ignored it? Have you ever been driving down the street and you see someone on the side of the road, and something in you says, you know what, I should pull over. And then another part of you, the, the, your physical eyes kick in, and you look at the clock, and you say, man, I need to be somewhere in five minutes. I, I'm going to keep going. Have you ever felt an urge to, you know, I, I, should, I should go up and say something to this person. I feel like there's something that God wants me to, to say or speak or some truth that I need to speak into this situation, and then you use your physical eyes instead, and you say, mm, that's going to be awkward, so I'm not going to do that. Or you have an urge to be generous. Maybe you see a need, a practical need. I should buy this person lunch, or I should donate money to this cause, or I should whatever, and your, your spiritual eyes see something. There's a nudging of the Holy Spirit in your life, but then your physical eyes kick in and say, eh, I don't really have enough right now to do that. What's happening here in this story is Philip not only has his spiritual eyes open to hear the Holy Spirit's leading, but he has his physical eyes open to see the need. And then it goes on in Acts 8, 30. It says, Philip ran over. <laughs> Man, I want to have that kind of obedience. The next time I am going down the road, and the Holy Spirit says, Matt, I want you to go do this, or I want you to say this, or I want you to walk across the street and invite so-and-so to Christmas Eve. I want you, whatever it is that the Holy Spirit has prompted me to do, I want to run in obedience to that calling. I don't want my physical eyes to get in the way. I want my physical eyes to see the need so that my spiritual eyes can call me into action. It says, Philip ran over and he heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up in the carriage and sit with him. I love this. I, I just want you guys to know, this is a confession. I would still be on my way to Gaza. I would have been distracted. I would have felt like I was a man on a mission by God, and I don't have time for this carriage visit. But not only does Philip stop, but he gets up in the carriage and he sits with him, doing exactly, by the way, what God was wanting him to do. 
and he finds a eunuch reading about the gospel. And we go on into Acts 8.34. It says, a eunuch asked Philip, tell me, in this passage, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. And they rode, as they rode along, I love this, by the way, now the carriage is moving. Philip is in the carriage. He's, remember, he's off of this. Uh, I'm still on my way to Gaza, me personally. Philip is now in this carriage riding with this guy. It says, as they're riding along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Y'all, I want you to understand why the Spirit of the Lord called Philip to this road. It was for this right here. The Spirit of the Lord did not want Philip in Gaza. He wanted him on that path. He wanted him going along that way. He wanted him to open his physical eyes and his spiritual eyes to see a practical need on that journey and to stop what he was doing and meet that need. And then it goes on in Acts 39 to 40. It says, when they came up out of the water, now Philip's wet. He probably didn't bring his, his swimming suit. The Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know what that means. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself farther north. Okay, remember, he was called to go south to Gaza. Now Philip finds himself somewhere farther north at a town of Azotus. He preached the good news there and in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. This is where I really want to end this, this thought with the words along the way. Along the way is where God is calling you to do ministry. You might have a destination for the end of this week. You might know what needs to get done before the week is over. You might know what needs to get bought before the week is over. You might know what work has to get accomplished at work before the week is over. You have a destination in mind and your physical eyes are sometimes so focused on that that you miss out on the along the way. As you are moving from here to there, and maybe God doesn't even have a plan for you to ever get there. How many of you never get all your stuff done at the end of the week that you planned on, right? Maybe God doesn't actually want you to get to that destination, but he wants you to be aware along the way so that you can be generous, and you can have open spiritual eyes, and you can have open physical eyes, and you can see what God is calling you to on that path. So that leads us to our what now, God? What do we do? Uh, most Sundays we end our time of teaching with this, this phrase, what now, God? Will you say that with me? What now, God? What do we do with this? Church, what do we do with this idea that we need to have a renewed mind and that our renewed mind needs to lead us to having open eyes? What do we do with this concept of open eyes? And I want to challenge you to do two things for me this week. And I, I don't want you to just... Uh, hear me, and then walk out of here and forget what I just said. I want you to write this down. I want you to take a picture of the screen if that works for you. Set a reminder on your phone, but here's our what now, our, our homework assignment as a church. I want you to ask God every day this week to open your eyes so that you can see things the way that he sees things. I want you to ask God that when you come out of the tent and you look up at the hillside, that you see that God has got this. I want you to, to, to look at your stuff and your bank account and your calendar and your talents and all the things that God has given to you and not see them solely with your physical eyes, but see them with your spiritual eyes to see them the way God sees them and recognize he's never going to call you to something that he can't provide the resources to help you accomplish. And one more uh, homework assignment. Who is God calling you to invite to Eve at ACC? Who is that person that the Holy Spirit has already put on your heart? 
And are you allowing your physical eyes to keep you from finding the time, from dealing with the possible rejection, from being worried about what it might look like? Are you allowing your physical eyes to keep you from the prompting the Holy Spirit is putting on you to invite someone to Eve at ACC? I'm telling you, at that service, we're going to be ex- we're going to be sharing the gospel clearly. We're going to give your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers an opportunity, maybe for the first time in their life, to respond to the gospel and give their life to Jesus. And I don't want you to miss out on that because your physical eyes were open and your spiritual eyes were shut. Who is God calling you to invite? Let me close with this encouragement from Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. It says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Remember, revelation is another word for open eyes. So that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance to his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Church, your God is a God of unlimited resources. And he will never call you to a generosity that he can't back up. Let's pray together. God, I pray that you would help us again to be a generous church. Open our eyes to see things the way you see them. This week, as we encounter people in our families and in our neighborhoods, in our work, in our our kids' schools, and all the places we encounter people, God, help us to see with eyes that, that are opened anew, that see things the way you see them. God, help us to be working through this process of renewing our minds so that our eyes can see things like you. We love you, and we thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.